Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Horizon. If you're able to, would you please stand up with us and join us as we sing and as we worship together. Savior, 
show the world your love. King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come now. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You are strong to say in your mighty name. King of heaven, come. We are the children of your mercy, rescued for your glory. We cry, Jesus, set our hearts towards you. Every eye would see you. Lifted high, King of Heaven, come down. King of Heaven, come down. Let Your glory reign, shining like the day. King of Heaven, come. King of Heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? strong to say in your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Oh, 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 Thank you. 
on this morning in 2 Kings, and we're going to continue to worship the King of Kings. And so today as we uh, begin chapter 3, it's here that we're going to find three kingdoms that join up, including the kingdom of Israel in the north, the kingdom of Judah in the south. And they decide that they're going to go to war against the Moabites. And so along this journey to war, they realize they have no water. And we'll see that as they approach the prophet Elisha with this concern, before Elisha delivers God's word, he says this in verse 15. He says, bring me a musician. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And I love that what we see here, how music can be the way in which we set the stage for God to speak. No matter the distractions that we're dealing with, maybe this morning with the snow coming in, that we can gather together with some musicians and we can worship God. We can prepare our hearts for God to speak to us. So we're going to continue to do just that and to tell God how much we need him in our lives and ask him to prepare our hearts to receive his word. Let's see. Oh God, how I need you. 
your my one defense my righteousness oh god how i need you father god we thank you for this morning that you've allowed us to gather to bring forth music to bring forth your praise and Father, our hope is that we have uh, helped to create an atmosphere for your word to speak into our lives and into our hearts. So, Father, would you do that as we study your word together? It's in Jesus' name that we all pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. It is great to sing about God being our king and also uh, the idea of needing him, walking with him, depending on him every moment of every day. We're continuing with that very theme that we've been singing about in our reoccurring uh, journey through the book of 2 Kings. If you haven't been with us, quick reminder where we've been. We did our summary of the Old Testament again, where we during the time of kings, after Joshua and the judges, we had King Saul, King David, and then King Solomon. And the kingdom has been divided into the north and the south, and God is sending prophets to warn and woo them lest he turn them over to Assyria, which is coming to take on the north, and Babylon, which is coming to take over the south. And so to help kind of keep track of all the characters, there's four kings in our story today. And so the north is now known as Israel. The south is now known as Judah. And the kings of the north are bad all the time, almost 100%. So we're making those the black kings. And the, the king we're going to look at today of the north of Israel is Jehoram. So he's the king of the north. And the king of the south is a guy who makes a lot of good decisions, uh, Jehoshaphat. And yet he also has a reoccurring theme of hanging out and supporting the wrong people. But he's got at least some good decisions that he makes throughout his reign. And he is the king of Judah to the south. Now, they both have relationships with kings that are under submission to them, uh, that are in a vassal relationship. So the king of Edom is actually currently subservient to Jehoshaphat who conquered them and has to listen to them, has to pay tribute to him, etc. And Misha, the king of Moab, is currently in a vassal relationship with Jehoram. And so these are our four kings, two of Israel, two of foreign nations, Moab and Edom. And what we're going to find is that, for the most part, in the north, Ahab and his reign, they have rejected God, rejected God's advice, haven't sought God for anything. However, we're going to have a dilemma that occurs. Misha, now that Ahab is dead, is going to test his son to see whether or not he still needs to pay that tribute. So he's going to rebel. And because of that, Jehoram is going to join forces with Jehoshaphat, and his vassal relationship, Edom, and go to, oh, and he's going to fall down in the middle of this battle. It's going to be really powerful to see what happens because he's going to be, go, be joining up with the three of them, and they are going to be going to battle to try and get Misha back in line. Now, Jehoram does not seek God, does not ask God for his advice, does not depend on God at any time in his life, except when he's in crisis. And we're going to find something that's true of Jehoram that I think is often true of us. Is that we treat God like a spare tire. You don't think much about your spare tire. You don't relate much to your spare tire until there's a crisis. You think, I hope I got a spare tire. I hope that thing's inflated. And I hope it's going to be for me when I need it. And we're going to find today that God wants to be more than your spare tire. God wants to be your engine. The every day, every hour, every minute relationship, that's what God wants for us. Not just the person we turn to in crisis to say, can you fix the problem that I have? But I think if we're honest, I know if I'm honest, far too often I reach out to God, I cry out to God only when things are going poorly. He's a spare tire. He's important when I need him, but that spare tire also needs to realize... He revolves around me. (laughs) When I have a need, I need the spare tire there. When I don't have a need, back in the trunk, God, I'm on with my life. Oh, I got a problem. Hey, God, 
Time to come back up, fix my needs, fix my problem, fix my crisis. God, clank, go back to the trunk. So we're going to look today at three ways to kind of overhaul your engine. And ways in which we can have a, a, not a crisis relationship with God where he's a spare tire, but a daily engine relationship with him that he's empowering everything we do. And I hope maybe you'll feel a little convicted like I have of how often I've treated God like a spot, spare tire. But more you'll have a hunger to have that engine relationship with God. Well, let's begin. And maybe we need to explore a little more deeply what it means for you and for I to really ask ourselves, are we treating God like a spare tire? Because he wants to be more than that. Here's what happens. God wants to be more than your spare tire. Opens up in chapter 3. It says, Now Jehoram, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel at Samaria in the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. And he reigned 12 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. This is not someone seeking the Lord, trusting God. How can I do it your way? But as evil as he was, he wasn't as bad as dad. Not like his mother or his father. He did at least put away the sacred pillar of Baal, even though he worshipped other idols. Nevertheless, he persisted in the sins of Jeroboam, which we learned last week was to worship Yahweh as a cow. So we're not worshipping Baal, but worshipping God as an idol. The son of Nebat, who made Israel sin, and he, Jehoram, did not depart from those sins of idolatry. So last week we learned that there were two kind of dark towers. There was a dark tower and a light tower like Lord of the Rings. And so worshiping Yahweh occurred at Jerusalem. And then we learned that Bethel was kind of the the dark tower set up to Satan, so to speak. And that was in Bethel. Well, now there's another dark tower set up by Ahab in Samaria. It says back in 1 Kings 16, he, Ahab, had set up an altar to Baal in the temple of Baal which he built in Samaria. So we kind of have two dark towers going on, not worshiping God, worshiping Baal and worshiping idols of of Yahweh versus Jerusalem. So as archaeologists have looked at this area and areas they've uncovered of what it might have looked like in those times, they found almost an identical Baal temple in a place called Dan. So here we are in Samaria, but it might have looked something like this. This might be the area you would be in. These are the temples that would be set up. Here is where you would come to worship Baal and what that might look like at the time. You would come and you'd bow down to him. You'd seek wisdom from him. Baal was your engine. These idols were your engine. They're the things you depended on for comfort, for direction, for help. In fact, here is uh, what Baal looks like. He's different depending on what depiction you get. This is a, a picture I took there on the right of Baal kind of a horned creature, and you would come and you'd seek him. And it was really a way of saying, hey, uh, my, my job is my idol, because he represented the agricultural range. You would depend on Baal for rain. He was also the god of sensuality, so there's a lot of sensuality in, engaged in him. You look at sexuality to be your comfort or the thing that sustained you. And then here, this is actually an artifact found called the seven wicked oil lamps. And they were found during the time of, uh, of Jehoram. And so instead of worshiping with the kind of instruments that God set up, they would use these wicked pagan uh, lamps to worship Baal instead of Yahweh. So this idea here is that Israel's been moving in reverse. And they have not been pursuing God. They've instead been going back. They made a little progress, not as evil as Ahab, but very much rebelling against God and following in these ways of idolatry. Well, we're going to find out why that is. And the reason that they're doing this is not really a faith problem as much as it is faith in finances and security problem. Their real idol isn't Baal anymore. It's now security, comfort, and money, as you'll see in a second. So Misha, the king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he was regularly paying the king, king of the north, 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. <laughs> Just to let you know... You're getting lots and lots and lots of tribute from the vassal relationship. It came with all the good. They didn't shear them first. You got all that wool. This is a lot of money. This is a lot of herds coming in. But it happened 
that when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Now this whole thing is a giant teaching lesson. Because here the king is the master. And Misha is a king that is supposed to be subservient to him. Supposed to listen to him, pay tribute to him, obey him. The irony here is Misha's rebellion against Jehoram is exactly the same thing that Jehoram is doing with God. He is not obeying him. He is not giving tribute to him. He is rebelling against him. And so we're going to see a picture of Jehoram with God in Misha's relationship with Jehoram. And he's not real happy that people aren't submitting to his reign. He's not real happy that people aren't doing what he says. Hmm, maybe one ought to look in the mirror. So we're going to see a picture of what he should be learning with he and God because of what happens here. And this would often happen. When a king died, the vassal relationship would say, hey, this is my chance to find out if the new guy is going to be as strict as the old guy. This happens often. And this is certainly going on here. All right, so what happens next? So King Jehoram went out of Samaria at that time and mustered all of Israel. Big, big armies together now. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, to the south, saying, Hey, the king of Moab's rebelled against me. Will you go up to fight against Moab with me? And Jehoshaphat, who always gets aligned to the wrong people to do the wrong thing, though he's a pretty good guy, and a relatively good king, he said, I'll go up with you. I am as you, and my people are your people, and my horses are your horses. And the horses are like, no, no, Wilbur, let's not go that way, Wilbur. So the horses have a little more horse sense than he does. Then he says, well, which way shall we go up? And these are not the smartest kings you're going to find out. I got it. Surprise attack. Instead of coming the normal way, let's go seven days through the desert. Yeah, that plan's not going to work out real well, let me tell you. Next, so the king of Israel and the king of Judah and the king of Edom marched on the roundabout seven days. And guess what? When you march through the desert, turns out there's no water for the army and no water for your animals, the horses, who followed them. And the king of Israel says, Gorsh. That's the Hebrew right there. Gorsh. Alas! The Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them to the hand of Moab. They blame God for their decision to walk through the desert. So, Joram picks up Jehoshaphat, picks up the king of Edom, which is in a, a, a vassal relationship. They go through the desert to attack Misha, and now, after seven days, they're dehydrated to death, and he's blaming God. So that's where we're at. So let me just show you on a map kind of what this looks like and where they are. Jehoshaphat, remember, he actually does seek God occasionally. When the crisis occurs, oh my goodness, horses are going to die, we're going to die. Jehoshaphat, not Jehoram, says maybe we should seek God. Is there a, not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of him? What, what an idea. So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, I think there's a guy named Elisha, the son of Savat is here. He, I don't know if he's a prophet, but he used to kind of wait on Elijah. He poured water on his hands or something. So Jehoshaphat said, yes, the word of the Lord is with him. I, I know who Elisha is. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So now they come down to Elisha. Now keep in mind this was not Jehoram's idea. Jehoram was just like, ah, look at God, he turned against us because we took the stupid way. But Jehoshaphat says, let's go talk to Elisha. He comes with, and, and now they're all three together. What are we going to do to defeat Misha? And here is where Elisha reads them the riot act, specifically Jehoram. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, what have I to do with you? When have you ever cared about God's opinion on anything? When have you ever sought the Lord? When have you ever wanted his opinion? When have you ever wanted his advice? Why don't you go to the, your prophets of your mom and dad? Why don't you go talk to Baal? 
now that you're starving in the middle or, or dehydrated in the middle of the desert. But the king of Israel said to him, no, 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 no. I know I'm in God's will because look, how else could we get three kings together to deliver and fight against Moab? Typical, you know, don't seek God, then blame God for being in your relationship, and then over-spiritualize the whole thing. Look, well, God must be in this, because how, how else would you get three kings together? But God let it. <laughs> and Elisha says, what have I to do with you? You're treating God like a spare tire, that you only reach out to him when you're stuck in crisis. Now, as Drew mentioned a few weeks ago, the Misha stone represented this king, Misha of Moab. And they've done all kinds of ancient and even recent studies to show that King Misha describes why he was being attacked by these three from his perspective as a pagan. In fact, they just found last week that the mention of King David is one of the, they were able to embed this with the infrared. And they found even last week, King David's name is mentioned here. But the piece that specifically is here is it says, I am Misha, son of Chemosh, king of Moab. As for Omri, king of Israel, he humbled Moab many years because my God, Chemosh, or Baal, was angry at me. So his perspective is, yep, I got into this vassal relationship because I didn't make Baal happy. And that's why I ended up here. That's the idea. A couple other things that are interesting is that this capital of Moab that he's in charge of is pretty massive. I mean, look at that castle. I mean, this is not some small kingdom that Misha is in charge of. I mean, that's his castle. And when these three kings are coming to attack him, he's been quite a force. In fact, here's the view looking out from that castle over the Dead Sea. You can see the Dead Seas out here in the background here. So this is an incredible view, incredible kingdom. And yet, he's decided to break away from the kings to rebel against them. Now, let me show you this path they take. It's just hilarious. So, king of Israel picks up king of Judah. They stop through Edom, going through the desert around the Dead Sea, pick up this king, and then they come about here to attack Moab and the castle. All right? <laughs> As they're doing that, here would be the path. Let me just look at there's some irrigation going on today, but all desert time, they're going to come around the Dead Sea, which is about here, and they're going to circle around and end up way over here where Carrick is. And when they're in crisis is when they finally call out to God. And Elisha basically says to them, why in the world are you seeking God now when you don't seek God most of the time? And I think that's the question we should wrestle with. Is God the engine that drives us every day? Our thinking, our praying, our repenting? Or do we, like Jehoram, only reach out to God in crisis? And God's like, how about you try out all those idols that you depend on all the time? How's your own wisdom? How's your own comfort? How's your status? How's your performance? How's your money? How are those other gods? Why don't you reach out to them when you're in crisis? I got a uh, letter recently from a guy who's been attending the church, and we ended up chatting together, and it was just an amazing story of a guy who was acknowledging in, in all kinds of vulnerable detail how his life's been going in reverse for the last couple of years, maybe even last decade. He said, Chad, I didn't even realize how far I'd gotten away from God. I didn't realize I was really being a lousy dad and a lousy husband. But as I've been coming to church for the last couple of years, God has really been opening my eyes to see my own brokenness, to see my own ego, to see my own selfishness. And I am starting to really align myself to God. I'm starting to really pray every day, seek his will every day. I'm starting to see the things that I was blind to and I would just kind of dismiss my wife's concerns. And I'm starting to treat God as a daily need, not just something I would turn to or pray to when I was in trouble. I think in one sense, I get to hear stories like that as your pastor all the time. But it's not just his story, it's our story. Sometimes we're in reverse and we need to get back to neutral. But neutral isn't enough. We need to move from neutral to the sense of saying, 
God, I need you to be the engine that drives me every single day. I don't want to have that kind of Jehoram relationship with you where I think that you can revolve around me when I need you. So Elisha responds to this by saying, all right, not for your sake, but for the sake of Jehoshaphat, I will pray and seek the Lord. That's where we move here to the second way to overhaul your engine, which is that God wants, an engine has to be fueled. So what are the things that fuel your relationship with God? What are the things that fuel your ability to depend on God? And he mentions two things here. And the second way to make God your engine is God wants to fill us up with the fuel of worship. And Elisha just makes this so clear here as he goes to seek God. So Elisha said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. In other words, you don't ever seek God out, but he does occasionally, so I'll speak and seek God for his sake. I would not even look at you or see you, he says to the king of Jehoram. But now bring me a musician. And it happened that when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. I don't know if you have a a pattern or habit in your life of, of worship music. I know some of us love worship music. Some of us kind of tolerate worship music, come into service 15 minutes late. Um, and I, I understand we all kind of connect with God in different ways. No, no judgment there. We, we, we all connect God in different ways. But I would say one of the reasons music is a huge part of our worship is because all through the Bible you see this, that music is a way in which God can speak uniquely, can draw near to you uniquely. And it wasn't until the mus- musician came and fueled the experience that God's hand came upon Elisha. And Elisha knew this, so he brings music into the equation to fill himself, to fuel the connection with God. And he said, thus says the Lord, all right, you want God's opinion? You want him to be your engine? Music played, we worshiped God, and he told us the direction we needed. Make this valley full of ditches, and thus says the Lord, you need water? Dig some dishes, ditches. I'm going to fill up your emptiness. Get more empty around here, and I'm going to fill it up with water for you and your men. Thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind, nor shall you see rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. Well, how's that? How are we going to get water in these ditches if there's no rain? That's quite a miracle we're going to see. But God says, I'm going to provide for your cattle and your animals may drink. And by the way, sounds hard to do. It's a simple matter for the Lord. He will also, by the way, deliver the Moabites into your hand. He's going to take care of your animals. He's going to take care of you. And he's going to deliver you from Misha. But notice, what fueled that word from the Lord was personal worship. I would just encourage you to put personal worship as a priority in your life. Find ways to personally pray to God, thank God, listen to worship music, makes you think about God. Say, God, I need to find ways to fuel my need and my heart's desire for you. Then, it's really interesting, before the miracle happens, there's a second way they worship. He says, I want you to attack every fortified city. So after I do my miracle, I want you to follow my my commandments. Attack the fortified cities, every choice city, cut down every good tree, and stop up every spring of water, and ruin every good piece of land with stones. Now, again, remember this whole thing's an object lesson. I want you to bring judgment on this vassal that will not submit. You're like, wow, we're going to do this and this and this. This is going to be bad. Yeah. And guess what? By the time Second Kings is over, it's going to be bad. God is going to do the same thing to Israel, who is a vassal that doesn't submit to him. And they're going to have Babylon and Assyria come in, and, and there's going to be all kinds of consequences to their land, to their people, because they won't submit. So even the, the harshness of the discipline is God trying to give them a picture of the discipline he's going to bring to them if they don't submit to him. But they're not going to in any way get it. So the second way they worship before they go into battle is through their their offerings. Now it happened in the morning that they offered a grain offering, which they did every morning. And then, after the grain offering, suddenly water came by the way of Edom. I love this idea that we worship God through music, but we also worship God through our giving. In the same way that music brought a word from the Lord, it was the financial giving of the daily offering that unleashed God's power into their life. And don't miss that. 
that if you want God to fuel you and if you want to worship him, the word worship means to give worthship or to acknowledge the value of something, that what our money does, it tells us what we worship. It's never hard to give to the things you prioritize. And so if you have trouble giving to God, it means you just don't value him enough or don't value his work enough. And so for them, when you worship with your music, when you worship with your giving, it's a way of saying, God, I value you. I'm depending on you as my engine. I'm depending on you in the situation. And that's what happens. So how does it, it doesn't rain. How does the land in these ditches fill with water? Well, we'll get to that in a second. All the Moabites, meanwhile, they look down at all these ditches now filled with water. And they're like, wow. And they totally misconstrue the circumstances. When the Moabites heard that the kings had come up to fight against them, all who were able to bear arms and older were gathered, and they stood at the border. They rose up early in the morning, and the sun was shining on that water that filled the ditches. And the Moabites assumed the water on the other side was red as blood, because the way the sun was hitting it. And they said, that's blood! I know what happened! The kings probably got mad at each other and fought each other, and they're all dead, and that's all blood on the ground. Moab to the spoil! So these idiots are about to run into an ambush because they've assumed a bunch of puddles of water are blood, and they're going to run straight into the ambush, unarmed, thinking that they're about to grab a bunch of money. It's a giant money grab. And oh my goodness... It doesn't go well. When they came to the camp of Israel, Israel's like, hey, look at all the unarmed people from Moab that are here while we're drinking. Israel rose up and attacked the Moabites, and they fled before them, and they entered their land, killing the Moabites. They destroyed the cities. Each man threw a stone on every piece of land and filled it. They stopped up all the springs of water and cut down all the good trees. But they left the stones of Karak intact. However, the slingers surrounded it and attacked it. So it gets devastated. But remember, this whole thing is an object lesson to remind Israel, this is what happens when you don't submit to your king. And again, as this book continues to move on, we're going to see a continued way in which God's like, you're not listening, you're not listening, you're not listening. And God's going to allow the same consequence to happen to them when they rebel against him as king as Misha gets rebelling against Jehoram as king. So here's my question. Is God your engine, and are you fueling that engine with regular personal worship? Through music, through giving of your time, your treasures, and your talents. Do you have a daily routine of of offering to God, not just financially, but also, God, today is for you. My grain offering. What do you want me to do today? How do you want me to prioritize my day with you as my engine, you as my king? Maybe you should try that as a daily habit. God, I just, I've stuck you in the closet. I've stuck you in the trunk too often, Father. I want to be fueled by you and fuel the engine of my worship of you daily. I had a guy who's been attending our church for, I guess I first met him six months ago. Never been to our church before. And for the first time, he met somebody at our church, and they began to talk about what God was doing at Horizon and, and the way in which that his family and his family's needs might be met. So he came and he met a few of us on staff, uh, came and interacted. I had a couple lunches with him. And every time he got together, he goes, you know, I, I, I didn't know about Horizon. I didn't know anybody at Horizon. He goes, I am just overwhelmed at how much you've cared for me, cared for my family, and the attention to detail you guys give to, to really loving on people you don't even know. We, we haven't even gone to your church. And what he was seeing is he was seeing that what we value. We value God and we value God's priorities, which is people. And he called me up a couple months ago. He said, hey, can I come talk to you? I said, sure. So we got together. He said, I, I have just got to write a check to say thank you to God's work through the people at our church. It's going to be a very generous gift because I'm just so overwhelmed by the love I've experienced. And I just love that feel. So I said, well, man, I, I appreciate that. We, we love people, whether you write a check or not, we love people. But he was, he was worth worshiping. He was 
seeing the value we placed in God and the value we placed in God's priorities, and he could not help but then say, I need to place my value, my time, my treasure, in acknowledging that this is the kind of feeling, this is the kind of relationship, this is the kind of work I want to be part of. I was just so humbled. But if you've never tried engaging in personal worship through money and through music, I would just encourage you to, to step into that and see how God might fuel your relationship with him by doing that. The story takes a dark turn here at the end of the chapter. And you ever heard a little engine that can or a little engine that could? Well, we're going to find out that when Misha is in trouble, Baal's not working out real well. So as what all of us do is when we're failing or when things get fierce, we turn to the thing we really trust as our engine. It might be our ingenuity. It might be our, how we identify ourselves. It might be our status. But when things get fierce or when we fail, you find out what your real God is. And it's not very pretty. See, God's son is the engine that can even when our gods can't. And it's often until our gods fail that we finally look in the trunk and say, maybe I need something else as a resource in my life. So the king of Moab saw that the battle was too fierce for him. So he took 700 men who drew swords to break through to the king of Edom. But they couldn't. They could not get victory over the king of Edom. So these three kings that are coming up against him are just beating the snot out of Misha. He is like, uh, we cannot break through here. So he decides to worship by giving up what's most valuable to him. So King Misha took his eldest son, the one who would have reigned in this place, his heir, and he took him to the top of the wall of the castle in Carrick, and in front of everybody said, this is my son who is going to reign in my place. And he offered him as a burnt offering. He killed and burned his son alive in front of everybody. And there was great indignation amongst Israel. Whoa! Wow! So they departed from him and returned to their land. They're like, I don't want to be anywhere near Somebody who kills their own son. It's interesting because when things get fierce in your life, or when you feel insecure because you're failing, what do you turn to? What do you lean on? He leaned what he only knew. Baal must be mad at me. And Baal always wants more child sacrifices. And all idols will require you to sacrifice. But the sacrifice you give up, some of us have sacrificed our health for the sake of a job. We've sacrificed our marriage for the sake of being a, the idol of being a good mom or good dad. Our kids have become our idol and we sacrifice important things for it. What have you sacrificed to your idols? And then you found that it failed anyway. You see, the only son that was sacrificed that can fill you with joy and hope is the Son of God. And everybody thought that Jesus had failed. (laughs) I mean, the disciples turned away. Well, this didn't work out real well, this three-year plan. When it looks like Jesus' movement is at its greatest failure, when the things could not be more fierce, not only are there nails in his hands and his feet, but far worse than that was that God separated and turned his back upon Jesus. Now that's fierce. Dumped all of hell onto him. All of judgment for your sins and my sins and everyone's sins, past, present, future. That's the fierceness that Jesus was under. And when every engine fails, when every engine, every other son, every other sacrifice failed to bring victory, Jesus, under that fierceness and under that utter looking failure, Jesus says, it is finished. And in that fierceness and failure, Jesus is the son that can, the engine that can when every other engine can't. And God is calling out to you and I, get me out of the trunk. 
don't know if I've ever told you this story, but I once had my, uh, my spare tire try and talk to me. I know, it's a true story. So I'm driving. Drive, my sister drops in the car. I had this Volkswagen Dasher, 1978 Volkswagen Dasher. You, you won't find it. They only made one. I had it. Everything went wrong with it, so I didn't make any more. It just everything was always in. So I hop in my Dasher. My sister's in the car. A couple friends from, from college are, are in the back. And we're driving down. We're going to go to Baskin Robbins. As we're driving, we turn left. We're going down toward Morton, Illinois, where I lived. As we're driving along, I suddenly hear from my trunk, clunk, 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 clunk. Didn't think much of it. Kept driving. Now it's got a pattern. Clunk, 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 clunk. I'm looking back there. I'm like, what's going on back there? I don't know. Try a little longer. Next thing I know, I look in my rearview mirror, and my trunk is going up and down. Whoa. Whoa. I imagine if I was a car looking at my trunk from behind it, it'd be like the trunk was talking to me. Hey, look at back here. There's something to see back here. You've been ignoring me for too long. Really strange. I'm driving along. I'm like, what in the world? And now the trunk is flying up and down, up and down, up and down. I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I pull over. I stop the car. I get out. I open the door, and I flip the thing open. It's my brother had hidden in the trunk. My brother is back there, clank, clank. I thought it was hilarious, trying to make a noise back there. He's opening the trunk, closing it up and down as we're going down the road. Ha, 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 That was the time my spare tire tried to get hold of me. And I found out that what was in the trunk wasn't a thing. It was a person. And God's the same way. He's not some thing, some wisdom you should use regularly. He's not some thing that you should pull out when you have crisis. God is not a spare tire to be put in the trunk. He's a person that wants to energize your life. So maybe what you and I need to do today, maybe our application to the story of Misha and Edom and these two kings is to repent. See, God will eventually bring that water by just having some floods flow. And that water will come down and fill those ditches without any rain. It was a simple thing for the Lord. And their land will eventually be filled with rocks just as Israel will be one day. And all the springs, all the things they went to to trust in and fill themselves up will be clogged up and backed up and broken. And all those trees they went to to eat and to find resources will be chopped down because they sought everything but the Lord. So how about for you? Will you sacrifice something valuable on your walls? Or you look to the tree where Jesus was sacrificed for you. And realize that what you've kept in the trunk is not a thing, it's a person. The ultimate son who died in fierceness and failure for you. Maybe today is a day you want to repent of keeping God in the trunk. Rather than under the hood. God wants to be your first king. Not your second king. And maybe our church services are part of that. Maybe personal worship is part of that. Maybe personal giving is part of that. In fact, we actually put into our uh, app, if you click on our app, the top right corner, you can go down. It will say worship sets. There are several worship sets our band has put together to help you personally worship. We've just introduced a brand new one, which is all songs about God as your king. So maybe you want to go and you want to go down to that app. And this week you want to use that as a chance to just realign your heart to say, God, you're my king, I'm your vassal. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to give tribute to you. Not because you're demanding, but because you're worth it. I see the worship of who you are. God, forgive me for thinking I can put the king of the universe in the trunk of my life. God, I want you to be the engine. I need you. Every day I need you. Not something I put in the back. In fact, if you've never used our app before, let me show you real quick where that's at. You can just go to our app, click in the top three lines, go down and see worship sets. There's like four or five different worship sets by theme there. And maybe this week is just your chance to personally worship with God by saying, God, I want you to be my king. Well, let's do this as we close. I'm going to invite Neil to come out. I'm going to ask us all to stand. We sang a song when we began. It was about, God, I need you. I need you. I really want you. It's really about depending on God every moment of every day. I'll just sing that chorus one more time. But this time, really ask this to be true. Say, God, I want you to be the engine of my life every moment of every minute of every day. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. My righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Lord, I need you, oh. 
righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Oh, you're my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. pray together. Maybe you want to repent right now and just say, God, I'm sorry for keeping you in the trunk. Thank you for dying for my ego, for my arrogant sense that I know better than you. And thank you that your son took on my failure. Thank you that under the fierceness of judgment, he stood the test. Father, come and empower me every minute of every moment of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, maybe it might be helpful for you, too, as you're thinking about ways to worship, to find other people to worship with you or to connect with you. We've got a couple groups I want to mention as we're heading out. We have a purpose-driven life group which can just, how do we put purpose into our life? Maybe if you're a woman, you want to connect with just Jesus' story and learn about the Son. We have a group called Seamless that's starting right now. You can sign up. Or maybe you want to figure out how to make God the engine of your marriage. I'm doing a marriage seminar this week called God's Home Info, and we're going to be looking at that uh, Saturday morning if you want to sign up for that. Uh, next slide, God's Home Info. If you don't have it, it's in your program. But we're going to be doing a three-hour seminar on how we can put new tools in our life that puts God in the center of our marriage. We'll see you all next week.